It's one story that I listened to many years ago and I've listened to it recently again. And even though I watched your, your interview with Tom Billiou really on the yes. Impact Theory, which was fantastic. Thank you. I, it genuinely, it was. The depth of that interview, I learned more about you then than I think I'd learned about you before because of the questions that he was asking. It was gen were you there? Yeah, I was it there. Was genuinely, <laughs> that was just a, a, a world-class conversation between two guys that were clearly very intelligent and, and willing and open to share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But the story that makes me always smile and it always warms my heart was when you got the job at the radio station. Yeah. And, and, and it just, because it reminded me of me when I was a kid, you know, facing rejection. Yes. And how I dealt with that. Would you just share that story from my listeners? <laughs> Are you serious? I love it so much. It, I mean, you, it was just such I a great... Oh my God, Spencer, are you serious? I just want, well, it was, it was so cool. Give the well, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I wanted to get a job at a radio station and I was looking for a way to make it possible to earn enough money to buy my mother home. And so this high school teacher, Mr. Leroy Washington, he gave a recommendation for me because he, he spoke to me and changed my life. I, I was labeled educable, mentally retarded in school, and he told me that someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. And, and that interrupted the vision that I had of myself. And so he asked me, what do you want to do with your life? I said, I want to buy my mother a home. He said, how do you plan to do that? I said, I'd like to be a disc jockey. He says, very good, here's my card. Go to WMVM radio station on Miami Beach and tell Milton Butterball Smith, I sent you there. I trained him. I said, yes, sir. I went to the radio station. Hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, I'd like to be a disc jockey. And he said, uh, do you have any experience? I said, no, sir, I don't. You, you don't have any experience in broadcasting, in journalism? I said, no, sir, I don't. He said, I'm sorry, we don't have any job for you. I was devastated with rejection. I went back and I told Mr. Washington, I said, Mr. Washington, they said, no. He said, don't take it personally. Go back again, you gotta be hungry. He said, some people are so negative they have to say no seven times before they say yes. So I went back again. Hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir, I'd like to be a disc jockey. He said, I know what your name is. Weren't you here yesterday? I said, yes, sir. Didn't I tell you no yesterday? I said, yes, sir. He said, why are you back today? Sir, I, I didn't know whether or not someone was laid off or someone was fired, sir. No, nobody was laid off or fired. Now get on out of here. I came back the next day, talking loud, looking happy, like I was seeing him for the first time. Hello, Mr. Vaudeville, how are you, sir? My name is Les Proud, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. He said, weren't you here the last two days? I said, yes, sir. Why are you back today? Sir, I, I didn't know whether or not someone got sick or someone died, sir. No one got sick or died. No one was laid off a of fire. Don't you come back here again. I came back the next day, talking loud, looking happy like I was seeing you for the first time. Hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you? He looked at me with rage and said, go get me some coffee. And I said, yes, yes sir. sir. <laughs> I love that. And yes. <laughs> And so I learned something from that experience about persistence. You know, Bandino said, persist until you succeed. And so I became the errand boy for the disc jockeys. I teach people, give before you ask. I would serve them. I'd get their lunch and their dinner, and I'd stand in a control room, watch them memorize their hand movements, and I visualized myself being behind the microphone, knowing my time will come. And then one day, it was a Saturday afternoon, and I was the only one at the radio station. And a disc jockey by the name of Rockin' Roger was drinking while he was on the air. And I was looking at him through the control room window, walking back and forth, young, ready, and hungry. <laughs> I was saying, drink, rock, drink. Drink, rock. I'd go and get him some more if he'd asked me to. <laughs> <laughs> and then pretty soon the phone rang. It was a general manager. I said, hello. He said, young boy, this is Mr. Klein. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish his program. I said, I know. He said, would you call some of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be think I'm crazy. <laughs> I called my mama and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all come out on the front porch and turn on the radio. I'm about to come on the air. 
I waited for about 20 minutes and I called him back. I said, Mr. Clyde, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, you not working controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go in there and segue the records, but don't you say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I hung the phone up. I said, now he must be think I'm crazy. I got rock out of the chair. I put a fast record on by Stevie Wonder called Fingertips, his first hit. I said, look out, this is me, LB, Triple P. Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle, certified, bonafide, and indubitably qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. You gotta be hungry. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate you sharing that stuff. That, that, that for years I've listened to, and now I can't I've been get it. I've that get for it 51 years. Wow. That's how so. But even at 75, I still enjoy it because I teach speakers. Many times when speakers tell a story, they just run through it. Like yeah, yeah. an artist who's been singing a song so often and they just improvise. Yep. You know, my former wife's Gladys Knight, and she does a song. Your former wife is Gladys Knight? Yes, I used to be the conductor of the Midnight Train. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes, and so she would sing Midnight Train to Georgia, but she always did it the same way you bought it. And I love that, and I told her, I admire that about you. And so when you give a speech, you want to always tell it like you're telling it for the first time. Yeah. Because people in the audience, they're hearing it for the first time. And those who've heard it, they're gonna follow along with you mm -hmm. and they want you to do it the way you did it. Yeah. And so there are people in the audience yesterday, when I was doing it, they were saying, drink, rock, drink. <laughs> they were waiting on me. <laughs> they're with me step to step. And I enjoy that when you can come into a room of strangers and, and you can orchestrate an experience and people begin to set back and their shoulders are high and they have this hunger in their eyes. I say, you gotta be hungry. And then somebody will say, I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> You've gotta go out and face the music. You go with the things I've taught you and make it happen. I went to WMBM radio station on Miami Beach Milton Butterball Smith is the program director. Hello, Mr. Butterball. My name is Les Brown, sir. I like to be a disc jockey. He said, young man, you have any journalism in your background? No, sir, I don't. You have any experience in broadcasting? No, sir, I don't, but I practice every day. Let me, let me audition for you. Let me show you how good I am. He says, no, we don't have any job for you. How many have been rejected? Raise your hands, please. I was devastated with rejection. I went back, Mr. Washington. I said, Mr. Washington, they said, no. He said, don't take it personally. Most people are so negative, they have to say no seven times before they say yes. He said, you gotta be hungry. Go back again. I said, yes, sir, I went back again. Hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you, sir? My name is Les Brown, sir, I like to be a disc jockey. He said, I know what your name is. Weren't you here yesterday? Yes, sir. Didn't I tell you no yesterday? Yes, sir. He said, then why are you back today? I said, well, sir, I, I didn't know whether or not somebody was laid off or somebody was fired, sir. No one was laid off or fired, and I get on out of here. I came back the next day, talking loud, looking happy, like I was seeing you for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Butterball, how are you? My name is Les Brown, sir, I'd like to be a disc jockey. He said, I know what your name is. Weren't you here the last two days? I said, yes, sir. Didn't I tell you no the last two days? I said, yes, sir. He said, then why are you back today? I said, sir, I, I didn't know whether that someone got sick or someone died, sir. He said, no one got sick or died. No one was laid off a fire. Now, don't you come back here again. I came back the next day, talking loud, looking happy, like I was singing for the first time. I said, hello, Mr. Butterball. He looked at me with rage. He said, go get me some coffee. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> My favorite book said, the greatest among you will be your servant. So I became the errand boy for the disc jockeys. I was serving them. I'd go get their lunch and their dinner and I'd come into the control room watching them working the control room knobs and switches, knowing 
My time will come. Let us say together, my time will come. When I'll be a top producer. And when I'll come up on stage. And they call my name. Because of my accomplishment. My time will come. Because I'm going to put forth the effort. And so on the weekends when the disc jockeys would come out to the parking lot, the cars would be clean inside out. They said, hey, who did this? I did, sir. How much do you charge, young man? Oh, nothing, sir. I just wanted to help out. Write this down. Build relationships. Build relationships. Give before you ask people to come into your business. Find some way to compliment them. Talk to them, ask them questions, find out what's important to them, what's stressing them out, what keeps them up at night, what drives them, what they value. Don't advance with the business. People do business with people they know, like, and trust. That's why you want to tell the story and ask key questions. You want to be strategic and experiential. Write this down. You have an energy signature. People are feeling you out. They're listening to you. They're watching you. And so, he said, look, here are my car keys, young man. Dinah Ross and the Supremes are coming to town, the Four Tops and the Temptations. I want you to pick them up at the airport and take them to the Fountain Blue Hotel on Miami Beach. It is my pleasure to serve you, sir. I would drive these entertainers all over Miami Beach in the disc jockey's big long Cadillacs. I didn't have any driver's license, but I'll drive it like I had some. <laughs> then one day, is a Saturday afternoon, a disc jockey by the name of Rockin' Roger was drinking while he was on the air. Rockin' Roger got so drunk, he could not complete the show. He began to stir his words. He's about to fall off the chair. It's a Saturday afternoon, and I was the only one there looking at him through the control room window, walking back and forth, <laughs> young, ready, and hungry. I was saying, drink, rock, drink. Drink, rock. I'd have gone get him some more if he'd asked me to. Then pretty soon the phone rang. It was a general manager. I said, hello? He said, young boy, this is Mr. Clyde. I said, I know. He said, Rock can't finish the program. I said, I know. He said, will you call one of the other DJs in? I said, yes, sir. I hung the phone up and said, now he must be think I'm crazy. I called my mama and my girlfriend, Cassandra. I said, y'all come out on the front porch, turn up the radio, I'm about to come on the air. I waited for about 20 minutes and I called him back. I said, Mr. Klein, I can't find nobody. He said, young boy, you know how to work the controls? I said, yes, sir. He said, go on there and segue the records, but don't you say nothing here. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I couldn't wait to get old Rock out of the way. I put on a fast record. I said, look out, this is me, LB, Triple P. Les Brown, your platter playing papa. There were none before me and there will be none after me. Therefore, that makes me the one and only. Young and single and love to mingle. Certified, bonafide, duly qualified to bring you satisfaction and a whole lot of action. Look out, baby, I'm your love man. I was hungry. Give the old man a round of applause. I was hungry. I was hungry. I was hungry. You gotta be hungry. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, you gotta be hungry. Do that right now. Shake somebody else's hand. Say, you gotta be hungry. Everybody can transform a kind of inconvenience in a huge advantage. Without any question, and it takes work. Now, there's no question that there are certain uh, situations and structures around the world that don't allow people to dream. 
you know, I'm doing some work in South Africa right now, Johannesburg. And my first step is to help people to learn how to dream because they were under apartheid, mm. a form of enslavement that did not make dreaming possible. And there are other places around the world that just like that right now, yeah. that's destroying people's dreams. And I think that's why we see such global upheaval in, in terms of many dictatorships, because people are becoming more enlightened. In yeah. 2007, Time Magazine recognized the computer of the person of the year. And the reason it did, because it gives everyday people access to information yeah. that they never had before. And so now people with that access of information becoming more enlightened and, and is causing a great deal of disturbance with various types of governments around the world. It's huge. My message in France, and I would like to spread that everywhere, it's you have a dream, it's possible, so take an action now. How can we, how can I help people to believe it's possible? It's an ongoing process. The faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. That's what my favorite book says. That you have to be an unreasonable person who's not looking at and judging the circumstances such as you see them. Yeah. But you're calling forth those things that be not as though they were. And if you read the book called Change or Die by David Dushman, I will. he said there was there is a person who is an unreasonable person who brings a message that it's possible and repeat that message. And there are people who hear that message who are able to relate to it and identify with it. Mm. And then they begin to move from and develop a whole approach to life with that new level of enlightenment. That, that as he speaks or she speaks, it begin to give people a vision of themselves beyond their circumstances and their mental conditioning and challenging them to begin to embrace some habits that cause them to make some new choices that will help them to carve out and, and become the architect of their future as opposed to becoming volunteer victims. Mm, great. You do a lot of speeches yes. all around the world and you are not the only speaker, yeah, a lot of speakers. Are. So according to you, why? I'm a trainer. I'm, yeah. I'm known as a speaker, but my gifting is I started out as a trainer, as a teaching trainer. people how to live their dreams, yeah. teaching them how to use their voice and their story and leverage their knowledge to go from being local to being global. Yeah, That's what I my understand. gifting is in. So as a, as a trainer, mm -hmm. um, why there are some speaker or trainer who give only a kind of information at the end you say, oh, it's interesting, and other speakers like you, according to me, and you feel something and you're not yeah, thinking about, oh, it's really interesting, but I can do that. I want to take an action. I want to change something in my life. I don't know if it was interesting, but I will change something in my life. What are the difference? Well, there are many speakers yeah. think that people are stuck because of lack of information. I always say, if that if information could change people, everybody would be skinny, rich, and happy. They don't need us to come in and speak. They can go online, they can Google the information. So Im information alone cannot create transformation. That in order to change human behavior, you have to create a significant emotional event. The materials that I provide, the training that I provide, yes. is designed to impact a person's mind, their heart, and their spirit. And so the goal is, is to distract, dispute, and inspire, to, do, to interrupt their story, how people live their lives, is a result of the story they believe about themselves. So when I'm training speakers, I teach them how to become a strategic, experiential storyteller, be strategic on how they use their story. You never make a point without a story, and you never tell a story without a point. And experiential, because Oliver Wendell Holmes said that once a man or woman's mind has been expanded with an idea, concept, or experience, yes. it could never be satisfied to going back to where it was. And so when you take that approach to change how they think and what they feel, then you now have positioned yourself to begin to create a thirst. There's no saying you can take a horse to the water, but you can't make a drink. You create a thirst where they want to drink, where they want to change, and now you have, because of their encounter with you, you have now allowed yourself to be an instrument, as Mother Teresa would say, in the hand of God, yeah. 
Yeah. And, and now that person will begin to write a new chapter with their lives. So it's, it's about how do we change the story that people believe about themselves that's been given to them by life, given to them by their circumstances. We learn between ages zero and five what's available for us and what's not available for us. And based upon those experiences and the people around us in our environment, yeah. a word formulates in our mind. It's either yes or it's no. A word formulates in our heart. It's either yes or no. It formulates in our spirit. Yes or no. And there are various things that can impact the formulation of that word and the conviction behind it and how we move our lives forward. Yeah. My goal, if the word is no, is to interrupt that word and to change it to a very affirmative yes. That's great. I love that. How to have a strong will? Because a lot of speakers are speaking about you have to have will, but how? Will is, I, that's why I talk about the mind, the heart, and the spirit. Yeah. The reason we celebrate Nelson Mandela I love is him. that for 26 years, they tried to control his mind. They were able to control his body. Yeah. But most importantly, they couldn't break his spirit. And so that deep down resolve, yeah. that dimension that's available to all of us is, was explained to us in the book called Man's Search for Meaning that Viktor Frankl, that there's a part of us that's always a part of us that's in our hands that the irreducible essence of who you are, that either you say yes or no, not based upon the circumstances, not based upon the pressure that's applied, but based upon your conviction. Are you going to give this the power to take advantage of you? Are you going to turn yourself over to this? We always have that choice. That's the greatest choice. Yeah that human beings have. Am I going to give myself a pass to surrender or am I going to stand up? I remember telling a story when I produced my first PBS special on public television of a man who came by the house and there were people on the porch talking and there was a dog moaning and groaning. The guy was curious and he went back and he asked the owner, why is this dog moaning and groaning? And the owner said, because he's lying on a nail. Yeah. The guy said, well, why won't he just get off? He said, because it's not hurting bad enough for him to get off. Just hurting bad enough for him to moan and groan. And so what most people do in life, they have the power to change their circumstances. You are made in the likeness and image of God. You've been given authority and dominion over everything on the face of the earth. But most, of, most people would rather moan and groan about their situation show up in their lives as volunteer victims rather than become actively engaged in doing the work necessary to change their circumstances. It's been said there are two types of people, those who work and those who watch them. <laughs> so you got to be willing to do your internal work so that you have the mental resiliency and your external work finds something that you want to master that will allow you to move yourself forward. Wow. So we have to, the first step is to find what we, are, what we want to master. Why are you here? What's your reason for being? Why do you get up in the morning? Most people don't have a clue. Uh, yeah. Pay the bills, keep a roof over your head. I think we have to reflect on who am I? Why am I here? What drives me? If I died today, what three words would I want said about me if I died today? You know, what is it that defines me? You know, and how, how do I define myself? Most people allow their circumstances to define them, as opposed to defining themselves and how they're going to show up in life. And so my mission is to help people to connect with the power they have within, their greatness. When you're pursuing your greatness, you don't know what your limits are, so you act like you don't have any. And when you live from that place, you can now be able to make a greater contribution, and make a greater impact with your life because of the fact that you see yourself in a larger context. One of the principles, there are nine principles that we teach of, of greatness. Yeah. The first one is each of us can achieve far beyond our horizons. 
and in avenues of life we have never explored. Mm. But most people settle in and accept things and life as it has been given to them, as opposed to rising above that, working to create something that they can feel good about. It's a first, first person principle. Yes. What are the next? The next one is we must take responsibility for our actions and our, our reactions. Yeah. When you look at your circumstances, you know, George Bernard Shaw said, the people look for the things that they want in life and if they can't find them, they create them. And so when we look at ourselves, it's about doing that. It's about taking ownership for your stuff, for your life. Mm. And one of the things I emphasize that changing is not easy, that changing your life, changing habits, reinventing yourself, yeah. picking yourself up after life has knocked you flat on your back. I've got to say, when life knocked you down, try and land on your back because if you could look up, you could get up. Well, that sounds cute, but that's not easy. When yeah. I was diagnosed with prostate cancer 17 years ago, that first time that happened, I said, hey, I can handle this. And then when it came back a year later, I mean, last year, 17 years later, and this time, It had metastasized to seven areas of my body and ate 40% of my T1 vertebrae. Now the stakes are higher. It was this life saying, okay, Mr. Motivator, you beat cancer the first time. What you gonna do now? <laughs> you know, I started laughing. When the doctor told me, he said, why are you laughing? Are you in denial? I said, no. I said, I feel like Mother Teresa. He said, what do you mean? She said, Lord, I know you know how much I can bear. I just wish you to have so much confidence in me. <laughs> So I said, the stakes are higher. So I've got to dig in and got to fight more. Because at the end of the day, life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. And so it's a fight. It's a challenge in life every day. And what we have to do is embrace it. What we have to do is see it as a project to be worked on it. I read something once that I live by, I said, in life you will always be faced with a series of God-ordained opportunities, brilliantly disguised as problems and challenges. And so I see even cancer as a gift, as a God-ordained opportunity. It's a kind of test for you to... It's a test, test, right. No test, no testimony. Yes. <laughs> wow. And so you have to be willing to step up and and handle it. Anybody can have faith, David. If, if the bills are paid, if they have their health, the marriage is working out fine, the children acting like they have good sense, uh, they have a lot of money in the bank, a lot Everything of is perfect. investment. Anybody can have faith under those circumstances. The true challenge of faith is when life knocks on the door. The true challenge when you lose your health or something happens to someone you care about or you lose your wealth or some tragedy happens to you. All of us over the next year will experience at least three tragedies. We will experience it personally or someone we care about. Charles Udall said in life, he said things may happen around you and things may happen to you. But the only things that really count are the things that happen in you. And that's where, wow, that's that. our domain. <laughs> That's where we have the control. Yeah, we choose the answer. Yes, we did too. And we choose how we're going to respond to this. Will I allow this to get the best of me? Will I allow this to stop me? Am I going to surrender to this? Will I give myself a pass? Will I wimp out on myself? Mm. That's always a choice. I love that. In the speech, just before you say the a sentence that I love. Can you repeat it about the fact that when it's hard... If you do what is easy... Yeah, I love that. You know, giving yourself a, a pass, giving yourself permission to stop. If you do what is easy, your life will be hard. But if you do what is hard, your life will be easy. I didn't do what I'm doing now for 14 years because it was hard to make the radical change in my approach, my dress, my learning the language of corporate America, gaining access, developing myself an intellectual resource where corporations would reach over people with years of experience, PhDs and MBAs, and I have no experience and no credentials, and be able to compete with them. It, it was hard, but we can do hard. 
All of us have moments in our lives when things have been thrust upon us and we had to do hard. So if you do what is easy, your life will be hard. But if you do what is hard, your life will be easy. And so don't give yourself a pass. Don't run away from hard because you can do hard. And through that, you discover a part of yourself that you would not know otherwise. Yeah, you are building your power when you have challenges and when it's hard. Yes, we, th those things only happen through growth experiences, through challenges. If you go to the gym to work out and you don't feel any discomfort the next day, here's what we know. You haven't done anything. Mm. And so you got to challenge yourself. Yeah. And you're going to get hurt. You know, Victor Franco calls it unavoidable suffering. Life is full of pain and disappointment. It's a part of the process. And we are proud of uh, ourselves when we overcome something. When we overcome things, we discover things about ourselves. No tests, no testimony, no guts, no glory. Yeah. And I was doing a broadcast once and a guy was coming up and he had crutches. He was coming up to be interviewed by me and he missed a step and he fell. It was a very embarrassing moment. <laughs> and I went down to help him get up and he said, don't feel sorry for me or be embarrassed. He said, it goes with being a paraplegic. I fall all the time. And so, we fall all the time in life. We make mistakes all the time in life. Yeah. You know, there, there's no life without mistakes. Anything that's worth doing is worth doing badly. It's worth doing right if you know how to do it. But if you don't know how to do it, it's worth doing badly until you get it right. All of us are going to fall on some tough times. Eight out of ten millionaires have had, had to file bankruptcy. It's a part of the process. You go up, you go down. And, and we learn things during the tough times. That's where we really learn things. That's, that's where we begin to discover things about ourselves. Adversity introduces you to yourself. That a part of yourself that you would never do otherwise when things are going real good for you. Mm -hmm. And so what we have to help people to understand yeah. is to maintain a spirit of optimism in spite of their circumstances, to give them hope. Why? Because when there's hope in the future, that gives you power in the present. So my goal is training 100,000 voices of hope who will do three things. Help give people hope, that's number one. Number two, teach them methods that will help them to develop the desire to reinvent themselves so that they are not replaced by an app or outsourcing. Because this is a time where you have to continuously reinvent yourself to stay ahead of technology and cheap labor around the world. That's, that's number two of continuing to work on yourself and growing and developing. And the third thing is to build communities, collaborative, achievement-driven cultures, supportive cultures that will help you to get to the next level. Have a group we call ourselves Cancer Conquerors. And so one goose can fly 75% further in formation with other geese that he could ever fly by himself. So if you got 100,000 voices giving people hope, that's number one. Number two, encouraging them to develop their capacity, their skill set. There's no shortage of opportunity. There's a shortage of capacity to take advantage of the opportunities that are available in the global economy. Yeah. And encouraging people to create communities of collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships. We can accomplish anything. And how can the people and me can contribute to these dreams? They can email me at yes, Y-E-S, at lesbrown.com, yes, yes, at lesbrown.com, and, and we'll be set up within a few weeks and send them out some information. But also in the meantime, what we will do is send them a, a video that as they watch this, they'll see the message that I'm bringing and a format. We're going to be teaching them the seven principles of storytelling so that they can learn how to influence and impact and change lives one on one, small groups, or in large groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So with 100,000 voices, you can make a big difference in this world. Absolutely, yes. That's, that's the goal. And, uh, because, and we want uh, 100,000 voices outside of politics yeah. and outside of religion, both of which polarize and divide people. Just everyday people. I'm not an educated guy. If both my parents came in here right now. I would not know either one of them. I'm adopted. I don't have any credentials. I'm just an average person and who I have a desire to make a difference with my life, to live a life of significance and to live a meaningful life and to help others who have a desire to do the same thing.
just before we are talking about to go outside our comfort zone. Right? Yes. And there are also some books about letting go. How do we know when we have to let go or be perseverant or committed or persistent? It's my own uh, difficulty. I'm uh, very persistent, but sometimes maybe too much, I don't know. <laughs> you know, that's, we don't always know that. I mean, <laughs> let me give you an example. I've been out in Los Angeles for about five years now looking to have a production company to sponsor a new talk show. I had a talk show 10 years ago. Yeah. I've done so many interviews and they all say he's great, he's sharp, and he's old. So I leave the interview to tell my person who came there and set the meeting up, he's old. I know he's sharp, but he's old. And then I was <laughs> looking at television the other day on the Discovery Channel, and a program comes on. Now my show is designed to give people hope. In the United States, more people died from suicide than from traffic accidents, okay? Wow. Now, I think something's wrong with that. My program is designed to give people hope and create them, it, it, inspire them to increase their skill set in this age of what the late Peter Drucker calls the era of the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. And to create collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships. The program that I saw on television that shocked me, among many, was Naked and Afraid. Two men, I mean two women, no, no, it was a man and a woman, naked, on an island, and this, this television show was designed to watch them while they're trying to learn how to survive on the island, naked and afraid. And at that moment, I said to myself, don't go and audition anymore. Don't go and talk to anyone else about your concept of using television, not just to entertain people, but to empower them. Find another way to do this. Now, do I see that as giving up on that medium? Because they're more concerned about head trash. I don't want to be in that toilet. Maybe, maybe I can carve out something else. Maybe I can have my own channel on YouTube and create a motivational channel from that place and be able to reach people around the world. And so maybe the instrument that I'm to use is not regular television, mm. but the internet. But leave that alone. Mm. That's so not my place. If I understand well, you have your purpose. Yes. And you keep your purpose, but you just change, you just change the way... That I approach it. Yes, so your yes. goal was not to have a production, but your goal was to impact people. To impact people's lives. And to them, I'm old because I'm 69. To me, I'm not retired, I'm refired. I'm ready to take it to the next level. I'm here to find out what is it that I have left. I've got a lot of life in me. And so I'm not going to let them to define what my contribution, if I leave the planet, is going to be. I'm just not going to try and get into that arena to do it. But just like now, you were giving me another avenue. I didn't even know you. And here you are talking to me. And this is going to be seen by people that had it not been for this relationship, yeah. this collaborative relationship, people who will see me who would have never had access to me otherwise. And I will do my best to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Everything that I need in this state of mind, this point in my life, he has all of that. I don't know what your goals are. I don't know what you want to do. But here's what I know. If you stay the course, if you feel that it's a calling on your life, you're going to have some tough times. You're going to go through some things. But I encourage you, don't give up. I encourage you to stay the course because it's real. All things do work together when you are in your calling. I was blessed with this book here, The Relationship Depot, with Reverend Jeremy Mahood. Where is he? Jeremy, Rev Reverend Jeremy. Yeah.
Give him a round of applause. All right, yeah. I don't know what made him bring this book, but I sure need it now. <laughs> oh my God, I mean, I need this real bad. But I encourage you to get it. It's a book that I was back there reading in it and it said, you are what you have committed yourself to. And I want you to think about your goal and dream, something that's important to you, something that gives your life a sense of value and importance and significance. My first major goal was to buy my mother a home, to take care of her. And most of you know my story. I was a foster kid, then mama adopted us. I stand on this stage because of two women. One gave me life, and the other one gave me love. God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. And as a kid going to work, with my mother who cleaned homes on Miami Beach for wealthy families. And you might have gathered, I'm a mama's boy. And I would say, Mama, what is it, Leslie, when I become a man, I'm going to buy you a big, beautiful home just like this. And she would say, well, Leslie, you don't have to do that. And I said, no, Mama, but you didn't have to take us in either. Mama, she only had a third grade education, but she had a PhD in mother, which she had drive and determination and I admired her I, I gave even when Father's Day came around I gave her a Father's Day card because she was mama and daddy all wrapped in one and that became my first personal goal and I remember shining the shoes of Mr. Sadursky Mr. Sadursky was a very wealthy man he said to his son David David want to become successful he said watch wealthy people and do what they do and watch poor people and don't do what they do. <laughs> and so I watched him and studied him. And he listened to motivational messages all the time. Earl Nightingale, we become what we think about. I didn't exactly believe that at first because I thought about girls all the time. <laughs> oh, behave. <laughs> I have issues. Okay, so... <laughs> and Zig Ziglar, if you give enough people what they want, they will give you what you want. Jim Rohn, when the end comes for you, let it find you conquering a new mountain, not sliding down an old one. As I was listening to these messages, unbeknownst to me, it was expanding my vision of myself. I want you to think about some goal that you have, some dream that brought you here. I don't know you, but here's what I know about you. You and I are cut from the same cloth. We are branches of the same tree. If you did not know in your heart of hearts that you could do what I've done plus more, you would not be here. You'd be home watching television or some happy hour somewhere else. But you're in this room, and I now know at this stage of my life, at 74, things don't just happen. There are things that happen that have value and for meaning if you're aware. And as a result of this point in my life and, and this email, of all the thousands of emails on that day when I came in, and as I was saying to Ray today, which is Al's father and his mother that are here, I saw them, I saw her. Give them a round of applause, please, for, and the whole staff. that that night I was thinking about my life and reflecting I'd, I'd spent some time at the Cleveland Clinic I'm a 27 year cancer conqueror because of God's grace and mercy and that night yes I kept hearing them say that the medication they'd given me every three months that it wasn't working anymore and they were gonna provide palliative care. And they were giving me something that they knew it would perhaps give me maybe two years. I said, what does palliative care mean? And so my friend who's a nurse, and she said, that means they're gonna make you comfortable. I said, make me comfortable? I'm gonna fight for my life. I don't wanna be comfortable. <laughs> 
I need somebody on my team that will be ready to fight. I want to put up a fight. I'm not just going to leave here quietly. No, how many of you understand what I'm talking about? You know, no, 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 no. As you think about your goals and dreams, here's what I care about you. Hey, life is a fight for territory. If it's peace of mind, if it's your health, if it's your relationships, it's a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. And so I want you to think about some personal goal. Mine was to buy my mother a home. I did that and, and took care of mama until she made her transition at 89. What's some personal goal that you'd like to achieve? Mine have changed. Now, I, uh, my kids, I'm a grandfather and I'm a great grandfather. And so my goal is to help them to develop their skills and knowledge. And I train speakers to help them to become voices of hope. We learn, we earn, we pass it on. I've, I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. And here's what I know about you and I don't know you. That whatever brought you here, don't stop. You want to have as many experiences as you possibly can because you want experiences that will reinforce your sense of self. I don't know you here, but I know about you. You have something special. You have greatness in you. You have the ability to do more than you can ever begin to imagine. And I want you to be with that and marinate yourself in that because we live in a world where we're told more about our limitations rather than our potential. And, and, and you, when you have goals and dreams, things are going to happen you can't imagine. I'll never forget when the doctor looked at me and said 27 years ago, you have cancer. Three of the most feared words in, in seven different languages. You have cancer. Can you give me a second opinion? Yes, and you're ugly too. <laughs> oh, behave, I'm sorry. I got problems. <laughs> I got issues, okay. <laughs> I took <tickle> myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and you know, it's amazing. Uh, I, I start praying every night. I used to pray in bed. I start getting out of my knees. <laughs> I was, I mean, I was called a Jesus, Yahweh. I was reading the Bible, the Holy Quran, the Kabbalah. It's amazing how spiritual you become when you think you're about to leave here. <laughs> I increased my tithes by 20%. <laughs> Look here. I'll never forget. Oral Roberts had this promotion. Oral Roberts, when he was alive, he said, you know, I have a special prayer cloth that he give you a healing. And so I'm listening. I was about to change the channel. And a guy came on. I had prostate cancer. And I, I bought the prayer cloth for $3. And I was healed in the name of Jesus. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so I pulled over. You know, I wrote the number down. <laughs> I sent him $100. I said, send me the prayer box, a blanket. This is a true story. You can't make this stuff up. And they said, put it, the prayer cloth in the affected area. So I, I stuffed it in my underwear, you know. <laughs> so I'm in Detroit, Michigan, church pack. I had a, a PBS special called You Deserve. And so people were very glad to see me there. And I was up giving a presentation when I speak at that time I was moving yes you got to go after your dream you got to give it everything you have and I saw people on this side looking behind me laughing I'm saying what are they laughing about I looked around and the prayer cloth had come down my leg <laughs> and I had left a little trail I said you could laugh if you want to I don't care how much you laugh I feel like I'm healed I got behind the podium and put it right back in <laughs> That was 27 years ago. I got some on now, right now. <laughs> they fit well in the pins. Anyhow, whatever. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm turning red, but you can't see it. <laughs> okay. okay, all right. I promise to be good. I promise to be good. Okay. So, 
So things going to happen to you in life. I'm telling you, if it hasn't, don't worry. Just, just keep on living. <laughs> Forrest Gump knew what he was talking about. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. You know? so, so mental resiliency is very important because you're going to take some hits. And so working on yourself, particularly now, there's no such thing as job security. This is a time where the late Peter Drucker called there are the three C's, accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. So one of the things that I encourage people to do is have an ongoing process to work on yourself because you're going to take some hits. And it's a part of this thing called life. In life, you're either in a problem or just left one or headed toward one. How many know that to be true? Raise your hands, please. And you will meet Murphy's Law. And if you don't know who he is, yes, don't worry. He's out in the parking lot waiting for you, you know. <laughs> I never forget when I, early on, was building my business and <laughs> I had this phone call. I'd been calling around to build my business and I was sleeping on the floor of the Penobscot building in my office, bathing in this thing down the hall. And the good times you put it in your pocket, the tough times you put it in your heart. And I had been calling a variety of companies, and I decided to call them back again. And this lady said, you're not Les Brown, the motivational speaker. I said, yes. No. I said, I am. She said, I played one of your cassette tapes for my son. And he came home, he pulled up his pants and stopped smoking weed. He, he had dropped out of school. He's back in school now. He's on the honor roll. She said, I would love for you to come to our company. I said, is that right? She said, yes. And, and bring a lot of your, your, your cassette tapes because our people love good material and I will recommend you personally. I'll come on stage and tell them. I said, what do you think I sh should do in terms of product? What volume? She said, well, it's going to be over... 6,000, 7,000 people at our convention, if you get like $50,000 worth of products, that would be great. I didn't have that line of credit, so I called the guy who was duplicating my materials and said, listen, Arnold, listen, man, I've got an opportunity to speak, and, and they told me I should get at least $50,000 worth of tapes. I said, man, I, I need your help. He said, you don't have that line of credit. I said, I know, but let me just get her on the phone. And so I called her back and I said, can you hear her voice? I had another line and, and he said, yes. I said, tell him what you just told me. We're gonna have about six to 7,000 people and Les Brown material. It, it changed my son's life and I'm gonna promote him personally on stage. I said, come on, oh yeah, little faith. Duplicate the tapes, man. I'm gonna sell them all and hung up. So he did. And she said, she's gonna send the contract out. We came by. No contract. Two weeks came by. No contracts. I didn't want to seem desperate. Three weeks, I started getting nervous. So I called. I said, hello, yes. Uh, this is Les Brown calling. Him. May I speak to Evelyn, please? I said, Evelyn died. She died. Did she say anything about me? <laughs> no. One of the arrangements <laughs> it told me was like that Friday. Oh my God. So I was in Detroit. I flew to Chicago to make sure it was her because I saw a picture of her, you know? <laughs> and it was her. I said, oh my God, Evelyn, why now? <laughs> so I was crying so hard they sent me with the family. <laughs> yeah. I know people probably thought I was the black sheep of the family. <laughs> back home they delivered all those cassette tapes at the hotel I mean at the Penobscot building I was trying to sell them in the airport <laughs> I was looking like a Mooney would you like to buy some cassette tapes I never forget when I went back to my hotel room and my, my materials looking at me say you got some motivation I'm motivator <laughs> 
You got to be hungry, huh? <laughs> oh my God. <sighs> that was an experience. I, I, was, I was saying, you know, God, why would you let this happen to me? He said, yeah, why not you? <laughs> Who would you suggest? Boy, it's called life. This thing called life. As you think about your goal and dream, let us say together, it's possible. Say it with conviction, it's possible. Let us say together, it's necessary. Yeah, you're going to go through some stuff, but you've got to decide that it's necessary that you're going to live your dream in spite of in spite of the setbacks, in spite of the disappointments, in spite of people letting you down, in spite of things happening that you can't anticipate, in spite of running out of money, and in spite of people making promises, you can count on me, and they won't be there. It's a part of the process. Make it not strange that you face the fiery furnaces of this world. You will, not you might. You will have tribulations. It's a part of the process. Let us say together, I will grow through it. And become better because of it. Yes, it's been said in life you'll always be faced with a series of God-ordained opportunities brilliantly disguised as problems and challenges. So it's necessary that you have a perpetual sense of optimism that no matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. Even when you have no evidence to support that. That's why we're taught judge not according to appearances. Because things can happen that you can't even begin to imagine when you're committed and you give your all. I believe this. All things work together for good for those who love God and call according to his purpose. That there's a calling on your life. There's something that you're supposed to do. And sometimes we have to experiment to find it. I didn't do what I'm doing for 14 years because I don't have a college education because I was labeled educable mentally retarded and put back from the fifth grade to the fourth grade and failed again in the eighth grade because I didn't believe I could compete with people with PhDs and MBAs and, and years of experience in corporations that I didn't have. I remember seeing Tony Robbins in an infomercial and I, I sent Gunther Rinker and those guys one of my uh, best speeches and they said, man, you're good and you're black. And, and I wrote him back and said, I never would have known that if you had told me. <laughs> and he said, we just don't think a black guy would have appeal to the, the average American public. And they wouldn't take me on as a partner. And they established that, you know, I had the complexion of rejection and Tony had the complexion of exception. Gave him a shot. All I wanted was a shot. And I'll never forget what my mentor said. He said, Brownie, he said, do what you do. Why are you here? What attracted you to this? I said, I, I, want, I want to change people's lives. Why, Brownie? Because uh, someone changed mine. Good. He said, do what you do. Stay in your lane and do what you do. Master that. And trust me, the, the things that you don't have going for you, you're going to attract those things. You're going to attract the people, the resources, everything you need in order to make it. And there's some things that you hear that don't have value at that point in time that as you continue to keep your commitment to your commitment it begins to show up in your life have you seen that happen please I've never had up to this point as long as I've been in this business anyone that has a skill set that Al has I've been doing this before he was born next year will be 50 years and when I read now, your latter years will be better than your former years because of this collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships, because I kept a commitment through all the disappointments, through all the setbacks. I, I just kept holding on and, and, and kept falling forward. The things begin to happen. I can share with this with you. It's going to happen for you. 
you, you're going to go through some stuff that you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. You're going to go through some stuff that, that you sometimes will feel powerless in the face of it, that you feel helpless. And it just doesn't look that there's any way that you can pull it off. But I can share with you, based upon what has happened to me, that don't give up. Hold on to your dream. Hold on. I remember when I was sleeping on the floor of the Penobscot building and Larry D'Angie, he wrote a book called Sora with the Eagles and, 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 and my cousin Boo who since made his transition when the janitorial staff came in our office, I was on the 21st floor, seven is my lucky number, I'm one of seven children, my birthday is February 17th and so we would hide in the closet from the janitorial staff. A new guy came on and he heard a sound in the closet. Larry broke wind. I said, God, Larry! <laughs> Guy opens the closet door. There we are in our underwear. I looked up, I said, it's not what you think, big boy. <laughs> This guy backed up, he cracked up. He said, he said I'm not going to tell on you, I promise. He said, he said, I wonder what you're going to say. I said, I know, I'm sorry, man. But you know you're not supposed to be up here. I said, I know. I said, no, I said, I'm going through a tough time now. I said, I know this is not an apartment. But uh, just give me a shot. Don't tell on me this time. He said, I want, and he did not. And finally, management did call me in and said they didn't want me living in my office. And I said, if you will help me, sir. I said, you don't know me. I said, I'm right there. I'm right there. I said, you know, I said, I promised my mother I would take care of her. She adopted us. And I just, I just need a little help right now. Repeat after me, please. Ask for help. Not because you're weak, but because you want to remain strong. Ask for help. And don't stop until you get it. And this guy, he said, okay. He said, all right, I will. I said, if you give me 60 days, I said, I, I'll make enough money that I, I'll, I'll pay the rent here and I can get some other offices. And he did. And I was asked to speak at a place called the Church of Today. Bless you. But Jack Boland, I got presence of mind, don't I? Yeah. Don't let this 74 fool you, baby. <laughs> I spoke at a place called the Church of Today in Warren, Michigan. And when I spoke there, people came out in strong numbers and traffic backed up. And one night, a television reporter came and said, hey, who are you? I said, my name is Les Brown. And he did an interview with me because it was unusual the number of people who came out. A guy named Michael King, who was in a hotel room, and he was inebriated, and he said when he heard me speak, that all of a sudden it jolted him, and he started listening. He called and asked at the church of the day, how can I get in touch with that guy? Then he called me in my office. He said, listen, I want to talk to you about doing a, a talk show like Larry King. I, I mean, like... A, What's his name? The guy who does those, those sleaze shows. I can't say. You know who I'm talking about. Sensation. What's his name? Jerry Springer. We, we want you to be a black Jerry Springer. I said, I'm not your guy. And hung up. He called me back again. He said, okay. He said, I'll, I'll be interested in what it is you're interested in. He said, but I'm going to send you something. You're not going to hang up on me. You're going to call me back. So, okay, thank you very much. I hung up. Then I got a call in my office. 
Sue Burkhardt was down at the other end of the office. And she said, you won't believe this. I said, Sue, why are you calling me on the phone? We're right in the office. She said, I, 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 I was so nervous, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I just opened up the mail. I said, well, come on down. Why are you nervous? She said, look at this. And it was a check that this guy, Michael King, I had no idea, it was King World, check for $1.2 million with my name on it. I said, this can't be real. I called him back. I said, hello, may I speak to Mr. King, please? <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me tell you. Oh, my God. He said, I told you you were going to call me. I said, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Things are going to happen for you that you cannot anticipate eye has not seen ear has not heard nor has entered the heart of mankind when you keep your commitment to your commitment on your dream because that's been given to you and and there are many times that a dream will test you how badly do you want it that's going to happen to you and, and so as you look at yourself and look at your goals and dreams let us say together it's possible it's, possible. it's, necessary. it's necessary i let some people go See, a lot of people don't ever live up to their true potential and never access their greatness because you can't soar like an eagle if you're surrounded with pigeons. There's, there's some people you got to let go. That takes courage. There's a reason we're taught to be of good courage. It takes courage. Let us say together, let go or be dragged. There's some people that will compromise your energy that they don't have the vision that you have and the dream that you have. Les, can I change them? No, 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 no. It's a full-time job changing yourself. And there's some people so negative they can walk into a dark room and begin to develop. <laughs> oh, behave, whatever. <laughs> the millennials, they don't know about that, all right? <laughs> Yeah, they're nourishing relationships and they're toxic relationships. Nourishing relationships, they bring the best out of you. They, they challenge you. That's, that's my relationship with Al. He, I feel younger because I'm in his energy and his vision and he moves quickly. He's making things happen. And he sees the possibilities in me. I don't look like an old man to him. He, he can see that I still got the juice. Can you tell I got the juice up in here, up in here, all right? And so you need people who can see your stuff, who get you, who know you. And so, I want you to write this down. Upgrade your relationships. Jim Rohn said this. Look at your relationships and ask the question, what is this relationship doing to me? Am I growing mentally and emotionally and spiritually? What is it doing to me? Am I becoming a better person? You have a 41% greater chance of reaching your goals when you have accountability partners. You want to create, as you look at your goals and dreams, a strategy for working on your mindset. Because you don't get in life what you want, you get in life what you are. People don't live life as it is, they live life as they are. No one could have told me, given my circumstances, if my birth parents stood up and said, hello, son, I would not know either one. No one would, could have told me, being labeled educable, mentally retarded, and failing twice in school, that in an hour and a half, I could earn over $450,000 in an hour and a half. And I don't say that to impress you, but to impress upon you of what your potential is. You've got some stuff in you that you don't even know right now. And, and the reason you showed up here, it's only for me to confirm and to validate that which is already in you. If you didn't know in your heart of hearts what I'm saying is true, you wouldn't be here. You'd have left already. I'm an assassin. I'll kill every demon in you, every mediocre demon. Trust me on this. You better run while you can. I will, I'm, I'm, this is no time to be average. The reason you showed up, because you know you've got greatness in you. Let us say together, I've got greatness in me. And it's my time to express that greatness. Shake someone's hand on your right and left and say, I'm ready to bring it out. Do that right now. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, I'm ready to bring it out.
Here's your homework. Get a three by five card. And right on one side, I give thanks. Like on my card, I have, I give thanks. I'm healed of cancer. I give thanks. I read that a minimum of three times a day. On the flip side, I read Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened. For everyone that asketh, receive it. He that seeketh, find it. To him that knocketh, it shall be opened. I read that a minimum of three times a day. Why? It's been 27 years. It hasn't happened yet. When will a baby walk? It will walk when it walks. Well, some walk sooner than others. When will it talk? It will talk when it talks. When will you be healed? You will be healed when you are healed. So don't give up. It's, 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 it's what Og Mandino said. He said, persist until you succeed. And I'm learning some things. There's some things that I used to be concerned about. I'm not concerned about anymore. When someone looks at you and says, you have cancer, there are things that you used to worry about. You don't worry about them anymore. I screen various phone calls. I don't take everybody's call. Why? I don't have the mental bandwidth for it. I have a criteria before I take a phone call. This is worth writing down. Number one, is it positive? If it's not positive, I'm not taking it. Two, is it productive? Is this the best use of my time? Three, is it purposeful? Is it in alignment with the direction in which I'm going in? And four, is there some benefit for both of us in it? I don't, I, I don't have time to waste. Am I making sense to you on this? Yes. yes. And so, so one of the things I encourage you, the guy asked me, if you had to talk to the 30-year-old Les Brown, what, what, what would you say to him? I, I would say to him, Take a chance on yourself. For 14 years, I didn't take a chance on me. I, I, I believe what was said to me. Mama said, sticks and stones can break your bones, but words can never hurt you. How many of you know words can really hurt and very deep? Am I correct on that, all right? And so we're taught, be not conformed to this world. And so in the environment where I was, I mean, I remember one of the worst moments of my life. I was five years old, went downtown with mama and I saw this water fountain. I let her hand go and I ran up and started drinking from this water fountain, Miami, Florida, 95 degrees. Mama grabbed me by the neck and started beating me, punching me in the face and the head. I'm mama, please, mama, it's me with a crazed look in her eyes. And I, I had no idea, why would you do that, please, mama? And then this white police officer came up and he was hitting his nightstick in his hand. Okay. You beat that little nigga boy enough. That's okay now. He's learned his lesson. Now I won't have to beat him. And Mama said, thank you, officer. Thank you. As he walked away laughing. And I said, Mama, why you why you why you beat me like that? She said, Leslie, you could never drink from that kind of water fountain. It's for whites only. Had he hit you with his nightstick, Leslie, he would have had to kill me. And I'd have left you and your brothers and sisters to fend for yourself. I had to make a quick decision. It was hard. I'm so sorry. I said, Mama, it's okay. It's okay. Let us say together, defining moments. How many of you have ever had a defining moment in your life? Raise your hands. That was a defining moment for me. And I, I remember as we were going back on the bus on Miami Beach, I was, you know, I'm like five years old and I couldn't understand why, why, what, why could I not just not drink from that fountain? There's only one kind of fountain I can drink from. And here's what I know, that in life, 
you're going to encounter some things. And you can allow that to define you or you define yourself. I was talking to a lady in the audience and she was working for this company. And they told her she'd been training managers and helping to develop their managers and teaching them leadership skills that would help them to become successful. And she said, you know, I want to be a manager. And they said, you can't do that. And so Stephanie Blake quit. Where are you, Stephanie? Give a round of applause. Yeah. So Stephanie quit, and she decided that she was not going to allow them to define her future and who she was going to become. So now Stephanie, she speaks, and, and on her card she says, we help you live the life you've worked for. That she'd worked for helping people to develop their leadership and managerial skills and even though where she was, they said, you can't do that. We don't have women managers. She decided to create her own path. As you look at yourself and look at your goals, Helen Keller said that in life, that when one door closes, another door opens. But most of us spend so much time looking at and talking about the closed door. We don't see the open door. I like something that Marion White said. He said, in life when you don't have enough courage or insight to know that you have outgrown a situation and it's time to move on, life will move on you. And, and so stuff's going to happen, but you have the power, just as Stephanie, to decide that's not going to define you. You have the power, you can become bitter, you can become better. And so I realized that in order for me to make it, I had to become better and I, I started programming myself, listening to motivational messages, reading 30 to 40 pages of something positive every day for my mindset. And, and I encourage you to do that, why? Because you can take some hits. Things are gonna happen. People are being replaced on jobs at an accelerated rate with artificial intelligence and robots and in a global economy. And so you, this is a time that you have to reinvent yourself and look for ways in which you can better your best. Today, you either expand or you are expendable. Let us say together, I'm expanding my vision of myself. I still have the juice. I can do more. There is more in me. The best is yet to come. So let us sit together. It's possible. I can live my dream. It's necessary. My dream is necessary. Of being debt free. Drama free. Stress free. And happy. And it's me. See, George Washington Carver, no, no it, I, I like this quote. He, he said, do what you can where you are with what you have and never be satisfied. George Bernard Shaw said, the people that make in this life and look around for the circumstances that they want and if you can't find them, they create them. And so this is a time that is the most incredible time in history that we have everything we need to live our dreams, everything you need. You can learn whatever it is that you desire to do. And with collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships and, and the drive, the hunger that you're gonna make it happen and not giving up because, and I can share with you based upon what I know, you will fail your way to success. You're gonna fail your way to success. And 86% of people allow the fear of failure to outweigh their desire to succeed. 
you're going to fail your way to success. And, and when you're willing to come back again and again, it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. What matters is how many times you get back up and say, that's all you got? And I can tell you that I, I remember going through a divorce from someone that I love very much. And my best friend, Boo, died waiting on a liver transplant. And my mother died, and I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. It was a tough time, and I popped. I, I took some hits. I was knocked senseless. I've seen fights where a referee would step in and, and stop it because they can tell the guy didn't have enough to continue. He couldn't even raise his hands to defend himself. How many ever seen that before? And that's where I was. I took those hits. And I learned something through all of that. That the key when that happens is continue to affirm to yourself, no matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. I kept saying to myself, had nothing to point to, had no evidence that, would, that I could build a case for my ability to recover from what I was going through. I had no, my, my mother, I'd never seen anyone die before. My mother and mama took her last breath. I, I remember saying, mama, I'm going to make you proud. I'm going to make you proud that you chose us, I'm gonna make you proud. And I remember before she had lost consciousness, she said, you're gonna be all right, Leslie. You're gonna be all right. And that stayed with me. And I ask now the stage of my life, I want people to know I believe that there's a calling on all of our lives that we were created on purpose with a purpose some people find out right away others experiment like I did I used to be a disc jockey a state legislator a community activist a photographer I used to book concerts I did a variety of things just trying to find my place. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Just trying to find something that resonated with me. My granddaughter, she's working as a security officer at this place, and she said, Grandpa, I gotta leave here. I said, why? She said, this is not me. I'm supposed to be designing clothes for people. That's what I'm supposed to do walking around a parking lot or riding on this little cart that makes sure somebody's not stealing a car. This is not me. It's about to drive me crazy. I said, baby, I said, a friend of mine named Darren, and, and he's written a book called The Misplaced Life. I said, you're living a misplaced life. And there is a place for you that resonates with you. You're just not there now, but you have to do what you need to do in order for you to get to that place. She said, okay, Grandpa. I said, in order to get that baby, you got to be hungry. Why do you keep on saying that? People that are hungry are willing to do the things today others won't do. In order to have the things tomorrow, others won't have. People that are hungry go all out. People that are hungry don't need an alarm clock to get up in the morning. People that are hungry, they use their time wisely to learn all that they can. People that are hungry know that average is over. Whatever you do, you've got to master it. You've got to make yourself stand out. She said, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I said, good. She said, can you send me somebody to be tired? <laughs> I said, I knew that was coming. <laughs> Let us say together, it's me. Let us say together, it's hard. How many of you know it's hard? 